there is a reason why you were probably dissatisfied with your education, why you felt frustrated and unfulfilled, why you couldn't find the meaning and the purpose behind a lot of it, why you felt bored, why you felt unfulfilled, why it felt brainless or pointless um, or frustrating. So if you're like me, when you were in school, you probably had some thoughts like, this is really dumb, or this is really boring, or why does it, we have to be at school so long, or what is it that we're doing? What's the point of all of this? Or I don't know if, if you like thought very deep into it, but I remember a consistent sense of dissatisfaction and it grew as I got older into high school. And, and I kind of got to the point where I was like, okay, well, high school education isn't all that great. Like, I mean, there were some classes like my psychology class, like it was so easy. Everything was straight out of the book. I think it was like the gym teacher that taught us. And as long as I like memorize some answers, <laughs> that was back in the Scandron days. And so we would just fill in the bubbles and they'd run it through the machine. I would get out early, basically every time we had a test in psychology. Or there were the times when you would pour your heart into some kind of paper or project and then you would still get a bad grade because you didn't check certain specific boxes with your formatting or, you know, your teacher didn't like how you put certain things or whatever. And so it was just a, a not great experience on a lot of levels. And so I was always waiting for it to get better and get better and get better. And I'm here to tell you that there is a reason why you were probably dissatisfied with your education, why you felt frustrated and unfulfilled, why you couldn't find the meaning and the purpose behind a lot of it, why you felt bored, why you felt unfulfilled, why it felt brainless or pointless um, or frustrating. And it's because you were not given a liberal arts education, which is the type of education that we had in the West, in the Western civilization back a couple thousand, thousand, fifteen hundred years. And um, this is how education was done for a very long time. And when I tell people that I have a liberal arts education, they don't have any idea what I'm talking about because all of those terms have been stolen, which I'm going to tell you about in a minute and explain to you what the heck this thing is and how education used to be and how you were genuinely robbed by people who decided a hundred, 120 years ago that you weren't smart enough to get the kind of education that people have gotten for hundreds and hundreds of years. And that all of that information is just unimportant <clears throat> dead white men that you can't learn anything from that is, it's just so arrogant because this is the foundation we stand on. But anyway, obviously I have feelings, but, um, when I tell people I have a liberal arts education, they usually think it's something like being an artist <laughs> like in the arts somehow. And they just don't even understand what any of these terms need. So I'm going to break this down and I'm going to give you a very like brief introduction to what this is and what you've what's been robbed from you. And then of course, because I'm passionate about learning and lifelong learning and becoming better and living the seven laws of life mission that I talk about in my book and all that stuff. Um, we're going to keep talking about, I'll keep come, I'll keep putting out, you know, information for you about the history of especially American education and Western education so that you can get a sense of how we got from there to here. But for today, I just want to give you just the basics of what the heck this thing means. So liberal, a liberal arts, liberal comes from the word liber, which means free. It's also the root word of liberty and the root word of libro, which is book in Spanish. So this connection between being educated and being free, because it was the educated classes that were free and you, um, got this education to be a free person is what it was about. Okay. So this is really going to surprise you, but liberal. Okay. So we have this culture today where the people on the left, the Democrats or whatever are the liberals. 
And so now in kind of conservative circles or whatever, this word liberal has this nasty negative connotation or whatever. And they're seen as like more open and more generous and more kind and all this kind of stuff, right? Well, liberalism is a Western cultural thing. And let me just read to you a little bit about it. It's a political and moral philosophy based on the rights of the individual, liberty, consent of the governed, political equality, and equality before the law, private property, market economics, individual rights, and civil rights and human rights. So we actually have liberalism to thank for the freedom and the ideas that we have about human rights. It, it, it was, it sought and established a constitutional order. So the roots of having a constitution of the, the powers that be, the king, the aristocracy, the, the, the tyranny, whatever it is, being below the law and there being a natural law that is above all mankind, that we derive those rights from God, not from government, and that the government has to submit to its own laws is a liberal idea. It's from the philosophy of liberalism. It prized individual freedoms, such as freedom of speech and freedom of association, independent jury, public trial by jury, and the abolition of aristocratic privileges. Okay. Now, the fundamental elements of contemporary society have liberal roots. So what is this liberal thing that some people are liberal, that the Democrats are liberal or whatever? What does that mean? Social liberalism. That's what it is. In Europe and North America... The establish of social liberalism, often simply called liberalism. So it's literally hijacking <laughs> that word became a key component in expanding the welfare state. Okay. So that is why it got hijacked. Now, F.A. Hayek, who is an incredible guy, and he wrote The Road to Serfdom and other awesome books, and he won the Nobel Prize. He wrote in, I think this is 1944, this word liberal was already being hijacked. And so he actually had this to say about it. And he, it's in the preface of his book, and he says, throughout this book, I use the term liberal in the original 19th century sense in which it is still current in Britain. Its current usage in America often means very nearly the opposite of this. It has been part of the camouflage of the leftist movements, leftish movements in that country, helped by the muddle-headedness of many who really do believe in liberty, that liberal has come to mean the advocacy of almost every kind of government control. So this word got hijacked from a form of education that's been the predominant form that has enabled us to collect and collate and categorize and learn from men and some women throughout Western history for the last many hundreds of years. And that is the foundation that we stand on in the West and especially in America. And this is a liberal country built on the principles of liberalism. He goes on, I am still puzzled why those in the United States who truly believe in liberty should not only have allowed the left to appropriate this almost indispensable term, but even should have assisted by beginning to use it themselves as a term of opprobrium. So they're using this word kind of deprecatingly towards certain people when it's actually the word that defines the very type of civilization and nation and people we want to be. In fact, um, Adler, Mortimer Adler said, the chief difference between ourselves and our ancestors is that they, for the most part, talked sense about liberal education, whereas we, for the most part, do not. So that's pretty fascinating that, um, that word got hijacked and it is the, in fact, if you go to, um, American higher education, a history it's by Christopher Lucas, it's really good. And you just go back to the index and you look up liberal learning. There's like row after row of citations 
because it was so predominant in America until the last century. This is what you've been robbed of. Liberal learning for the sake of learning itself, learning to be free and the education of a free people versus vocational, which is learning for the sake of earning. So those are the two kinds of learning you could do. And what we've done is take a liberal foundation and you went and got vocational learning through apprenticeships, right? And some trade schools. So everyone had the education to be free. Everyone had, in fact, there's all kinds of quotes from the founding generation after, you know, as they're putting America together and after we win the war, they're like, oh my goodness, okay, now we need to put an education in place to match our governmental model. So we need people to understand what creates freedom so that they can stay free, so that we can have a free nation and a free people. And so we wanted this liberal education so that people knew how to be free. And like Adler says, in fact, I will read you this quote. He says, for anyone to become an educated person, it is necessary for his or her learning to continue throughout the lifetime that follows graduation from college or university. The most crucial contribution that these institutions can make is in the field of the arts, the liberal arts, which are the arts of learning and the arts which discipline our creative powers. In fact, he has a quote. I couldn't find it exactly. It's something about education um, frees our minds by disciplining them. And so our education is supposed to discipline our mind and help us to know how to find and latch on to and adhere to truths. And Mortimer Adler, I'll talk to you in another video about the great book said and the history of how that all went down and how we lost liberal learning in America. But just for now, just know he was a very key pivotal person in trying to hang on to liberal learning in America. And, um, one of the, and, and what he's saying is, your edu you know, what he, he made the argument a lot that the best education happens as an adult. And he's right, because it's only then that you have all these real experiences in the world that make your education mean so much more. Like I could read Anna Karenina in college, but 10 years later or 15 years later, when I've had a troubled marriage myself and I have been through a lot more life, Anna Karenina means a whole lot more to me, right? And so we need the tools for lifelong learning. And that's what liberal education was giving people. And there was a very specific way that this was done. So let me, let me explain this to you really quick. So we understand what the liberal part is. What's the arts part? Liberal arts are not fine arts and they're not vocational arts. So they're not arts for the sake of earning and they're not arts. They're not the fine arts for the sake of beautifying. Okay. They're the liberal arts for the sake of being free of disciplining the mind of learning how to use our intellectual and rational powers to their utmost. The fine arts are totally useless. And that is their glory because the fine arts are meant to move the heart and to move the culture toward beauty and goodness. The liberal arts are useful, but the liberal arts themselves are the arts of the trivium and the quadrivium, which in the modern form include reading, writing, speaking, listening, and all the mathematical disciplines and scientific skills. So this hangover that we have in our schools where those are our focus, we are still kind of trying, attempting to do the liberal arts, but we're doing it without the same medium in which it was done in the past. We're doing it in a textbook model, which doesn't work. And we're doing it without this tool set for liberal learning. And so we're hanging on to, okay, people need to write. Um, they need to read, they need to calculate, but we're not bringing it home. The liberal arts are also meant to help us live a robust life of truth, right? And so they're meant to be the search for truth. And that's what universe, that's why Harvard's, um, motto was very toss. It's like the search for truth, right? And so this is what these colleges and universities were founded upon is the liberal arts that are the search for truth that help us to live the good life that help us to pursue our happiness, our real happiness in conjunction with God's natural laws. And the fine arts were meant to be for, um, those that would go on to produce works of art that would inspire humanity. 
And the liberal arts was for everyone so that they could perpetuate a free society. And the vocational arts were the training so that you could earn money in a certain vocation. And today we have some of these leftovers of what the liberal education was supposed to be. Sometimes we call it the humanities, we call it general education, um, but it's turned into, especially at the college level, a lot of social indoctrination. It's, it's money driven because these aren't private schools anymore that can make their own independent decisions. They're getting government funding and they're dependent on that funding. And so the government is telling them what to teach and there's not that autonomy and there's just not the priority anymore to help us be a free people. I could give you all kinds of examples of all kinds of things that went on in American history and Western history that you have never heard about because they are not in the school curriculums because this is how it used to be done. It was very, very simple. You choose a book of broad and deep significance, what we would call a great book. That's where the great books of the Western world come from or the Harvard classics. These are books that have borne the test of time. These are books that have spoken to people in many generations and many time periods and many different um, situations. And one of the things that we have in our modern day is we have moving more and more towards this technological society so that we, we think we can leave behind um, some of these great works. But I will tell you some of like, for example, the people that you would know, the Plato and the Aristotle that I've studied are completely relevant today. The kinds of things that they talk about are the kinds of things that are on my mind. Um, the way that they talk about them or it's way above my head. It's very difficult for me to understand, even in modern translations into English. I'm, I'm limping along to really, um, I'll tell you this quote by Mortimer Adler, one of my favorites, whoever passes by what is over his head, condemns its head, condemns his head to its present low altitude <laughs> for nothing can elevate a mind except what is over the head. So you, they chose these really deep, really rich. I did another, um, video on the five types of questions. And I talked about St. Thomas Aquinas treaties on the passions. And that's the kind of reading that we're talking about. Like we all have passions. And he said the passions went in a certain order and he talked about the passions. And that's the kind of thing that you and I think about today. What are my emotions? How do my emotions work? How much should I listen to them? Um, so they're relevant. They're important. They're lasting. They've had impact. They've changed the world. And so we need to understand what they say. Why did they change the world? Why did they have so much impact? And so they would choose a really rich reading and often it would be in the original. And these men would choose, would, would learn Latin and Greek. And sometimes women would, um, and then they would study that work, little, little chunks of it in, uh, by reading and writing in a commonplace book. Now, you know, books were a rare commodity. They weren't printed as much as they are now. I talked to people about writing in their books, but of course you wouldn't do that in that time and place because they were too expensive and hard to come by. So you would write in your commonplace book, your thoughts, your insights, your questions, um, your favorite quotes, you would copy down long passages and learn them that way. And then you would come into a small pod with a tutor, a mentor, and you would discuss, he would ply you with valuable questions. He would seek deeply. And, and, and if you want to have a better understanding of what this looks like, go to that five types of questions. And I give you an example through one of Mortimer Adler's classes that you would be plied with these questions. And then you would have this really incredible discussion about it. And this is why book groups were prolific in early America. I mean, Benjamin Franklin, his autobiography, I should do probably a video on that, but the way he kind of started up the first library and kind of made book clubs and uh, be in fashion was really phenomenal, like elevated the educational level of all of that um, generation and beyond. And so, and then eventually when you were ready, you would uh, have an oral exam and that's how they would know that you had really taken it in, that had become part of who you are because you could vocalize it. You could explain it clearly to someone else and you had gained those skills of discussion and negotiation and seeking for truth and, and, and finding it. And all of these rich mental skills had been honed and fine tuned year after year by discussion with your peers and with your tutors. Um, the last little piece of this that liberal arts education is meant to be about is the use of free time. 
what was called, and it's sometimes called leisure, our leisure activities. And Mortimer Adler makes the argument that you can tell the quality of a person's education by what they choose to do in their free time, by how elevated their leisure time is. Do they play instruments? Do they get involved in the community? Do they help in government? Do they serve in, in, in places? Do they develop their um, fine art skills? Do they build relationships? Do they read quality books? Um, do they just elevate themselves and the people around them in any useful way? And the quality of that leisure time is a mark of a truly educated individual that if they had a true liberal education, they would always be doing those things that were most enriching. He says, a good human life is one that is enriched by as much leisure as one can cram into it. And so you're always finding ways to elevate yourself as a human and to elevate humanity through the leisure time that you have when you don't have to be working. Um, so if you were dissatisfied like I was, if you felt frustrated in the kind of education that you were given, if you feel like there must have been something missing, you were right. You were robbed. Through the years, through the last century and a half, bits and pieces of this education eroded away, eroded and, and left the school system until now, you can expect to be in low quality textbooks that are many, um, many versions away from any kind of original writing. You can expect not to interact with great minds and great individuals. You can expect not to hear from uh, and about some of the most important points in Western history. And you can expect to be writing for a professor instead of for yourself and looking for the right answers and staying at the level of knowledge questions like I talked about in that five types of questions video rather than looking for deep meaning and truth and finding ways to apply it in your life. So I hope that clears up the question of what you've been robbed of. And that liberal arts education is the education we all need to be the best human beings that we can, that we can possibly be. And I spent many, many years, 15, 16 years in structured, formal, traditional public education. And then later on, I found liberal education and it has absolutely changed me completely as a person, the way I live, the way I think, um, the way I do use my leisure time and the things that I teach and, and my highest priorities and values. And it's these great minds that I got to interact with. And it is these tools for lifelong learning that have absolutely transformed the way that I live. If that's something that you want more of in your life, we do learn these skills. We do interact with the great minds. We do spend time in classics and great books at the Mission Driven Mom, the MDM Academy. So you can head on over there and do your seven day free trial. Check that out. Tell me in the comments below your experience with school, what you wish you would have had, what you felt you missed out on and what your next steps are.